Here's a little story about Gilgamesh With a hip-hop beat to keep it nice and fresh But can this ancient story teach us something new? After all this time, are the lessons true? Let's take it back to where the story begins Home of the Mesopotamians Ruled by a king that was part divine The people of Orogoth fell in line Now you think he'd do his people right But he slept with all the ladies on their wedding night The city hoped the gods would come to the rescue So they made a hairy creature called Enkidu Man and beast, it was quite complex But the lady made him human when they had some well, she took him to the city to confront the king When Gilgamesh was about to do his thing A rumble ensued and in the end Both the king and the newbie were the best of friends Gilgamesh What would you expect these guys to do? They wanted an adventure, if that's a clue. On to the teeth, they set out west to become more famous than all the rest. The creature whom Baba was in their sights, but Gilgamesh was dreaming when he slept at night. They both were scared, but as you might expect, the creature of the forest they gone and wrecked. Now, when they got back, who was waiting there? Ishtar, the goddess, all bright and fair. Marry me, she said, to her newfound hottie, but giving it to her, Gilgamesh was not. He told her about the guys to whom she'd been engaged. This set her into a full out. Raised. She got the bowl of heaven and let it loose, but our heroes demonstrated that they had the juice. Gilgamesh. Gilgamesh. Well, it turned out their behavior was a tad askew. So Sentinel up and killed Enkidu. The king realized that he was just a man, so to get eternal life, he devised a plan. To the ends of the earth, he made a trip through a tunnel to a bar. Then he found a ship. It took him to the guy that survived the flood. Dude, the piston was his name, and he said, Hey, stuff, you can't get eternal life like me, but I'll tell you about a plant that's in the sea. To get that plant, he took a dive. Now he'd always have the power to survive. But the plant was stolen by a snake. Can you believe his luck? Why can't he catch a break? All his journeys made him realize that even though everybody lives and dies, when people in the future heard of his name, he lived forever in all his fame. So that's a little story about Gilgamesh with the hip hop beat to keep it nice and fresh. Two. Greetings, fellow Earthlings. Uh, welcome to the Disciple of Kairos channel, a YouTube channel brought to you by Jim, the Mustache Majors. And uh, Jim, if you're listening, please call me. We expected Jim to be here tonight. He's been kind enough to uh, allow us to do this stream on his channel, and he was to be here with us to help me interview uh, these two fine couples. Um, my thanks to DJ Digiham uh, <laughs> for opening the show. Um, and if you want to see more of that, please go to Digital Hammurabi, and uh, you can put that on a continuous loop. Um, <laughs> if you have that sort of masochistic well, no, nature. What we need to do is make a 10-hour version of that. Yes. No, we don't need to do that. <laughs> um, you know, I suggest that you make it your ringtone, people. Uh, so but as, I'm going to be assigning it to my class. Th th there you go. I mean, and uh, I I know for a fact that you are open to suggestions, Dr. Misha, because I offhandedly uh, gave you a nickname and you adopted it immediately <laughs> into your into your Twitter handle. Um, I love it. Yeah. So uh, uh, I was working on, you know, uh, try to work on nicknames for all of you and I, I couldn't come up with anything you know so all the only one i got is misha the historical oracle griffith um so i'm gonna i'm gonna quit one i love it up. so as you probably can see in the title folks uh tonight's topic is uh monster mythos the history of legendary creatures we're gonna and, cover uh, it all in one night we're going to cut it all one night, so we may be here till five in the morning, but but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, and that that topic uh, was thought up uh, and suggested by Dr. Misha, and we'll talk more about that here in a few minutes. Now, um, before we get to the discussion part, we're going to learn about uh, their channels real quick. Um, uh, some of you may have seen me um, on the GDC channel. I do streams there once a week, but. Uh, this week, Jim asked me to come over here and co-host, and now I'm, I've been thrust into the uh, role of, of uh, host uh, since we can't seem to locate Jim. 
And uh, again, let me say, Jim, if you're out there, find some way to communicate with us because we'd like to know that everything's okay with you. Um, now, uh, as far as uh, Dr. Josh and Megan go, their channel is named Digital Hammurabi. As far as uh, Dr. Misha and Jerry go, uh, their channel is called History Unsettled. And also Dr. Misha has a channel, which is, uh, which is called uh, Dr. Misha Griffith, right? Is it, or is it Misha Griffith? I, I actually, I generally put my, uh, just put my lectures and things up there. So they might not find that that interesting. And that's not really intended for public consumption. Sure. So I, I, we try to edit down the good stuff and, and make, when, it, when it's <laughs> amusing, we stick it onto the History right. Unsettled channel. Well, okay. Uh, um, well, uh, well, we'll let the viewers decide, you know, whether they find find uh, either, you know, who knows. It's out, it's out there for public consumption, so please go check both of them out. At the close of this, uh, so we will put a pinned comment in the comment section. We'll have uh, all these folks' uh, information as far as their YouTube channels or anything else they want you to know about. Um, so uh, let me start uh, by asking uh, Jerry and Misha, uh, what is it that both of you made you decide that you wanted to put content on YouTube? Well, I was really looking for a career in swimsuit modeling, but they told me to look into the field. And so this is sort of the next best thing. Yeah. We've been making historical documentaries for, for decades. Yes. Back when, historical. yeah, back before digital video, back before YouTube, back before, oh gosh, back before the Iron Age, I think. <laughs> So uh, just We've getting interviews with Alexander, they're great. They're really interesting. They're really interesting. <laughs> but um, absolutely, uh, this is just making videos has been a hobby and kind of a business for us for years and years. So this was just kind of a natural way to do things. Uh, and of course, we got started with uh, with the various other um Yeah, I had a whole channel that I did called uh, Useless History, which yeah. is just funny stories. But that just it's darn much work. <laughs> <laughs> and we wanted something we could do together. And so we right. decided, you know, this is a fun thing to do. And we try to explore topics that are unsettled, where things aren't, doesn't everybody, didn't, everybody agrees John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln in the right. theater. But your joke. No, he didn't. He shot him in the theater. No, he shot him in the back of the head. That's right. He yes, that's right. That's, that's, that's <laughs> but the point is, you're, kind of you're, you're, you're actually uh, causing me to go off my uh, list of questions I wrote here for, for, for both uh, both couples there because I'm now I'm kind of remembering, remembering uh, an inkling of a conversation that I had with you in some other hangout, uh, Dr. Misha. You said you guys have been creating uh, videos for decades. Didn't you? folks used to create videos for like a PBS station or local something to do with where they went on television or am yeah, I thinking of somebody yeah. else? Uh, I worked with, for a PBS station and um, that's actually, I mean, now, reality is boring. I try to spice it up a little bit. The reality is I worked for a PBS station in remote Northern California, again, in the Iron Age. And Misha got drafted and helped a lot hauling gear. And we did historical shows. We did a, a first show that we ever did was on Japanese American internment camps. And she was usually hauling gear, but doing the yeah. research and speaking for you. But the feeling yeah. that I got was that she enjoyed the research more than she enjoyed hauling the gear. Uh, so she went oh, yeah. back to well, school and became the smart one. That, uh, no, um, basically I, uh, and I worked in theater forever. So I wanted to go back to, to graduate school and get, get a degree and teach. So that's and what that's what you, that's what you do now. You're you're a college professor, correct? right? Okay. Right. Let me turn let me turn to Digital Hammurabi for a minute. Uh, Megan and, and Josh, what what is it that? Uh, oh, I'm sorry, DJ Diddy. <laughs> uh, uh, what is it that? Uh, what is it that caused you guys to decide that? You, hey, you know what? I, we're gonna we're gonna create content for YouTube. Poverty. <laughs> Oh, no, not, not that. <laughs> YouTube is good for poverty. <laughs> um, so um, I think it was suggested on a live stream over a year ago. Um, and we thought, 
why not? That sounds like fun. Um, and it's actually, it's really um, filled a lack in our lives. Both of us are trained academics, but um, due to personal circumstances, can't actually pursue a career in traditional academia. Um, we... I mean, look at those books. We are like <laughs> wicked smart. We have many books. If that's well, those, those are, indication those are of books. Those, that's not a wood block that's shaped to look like a bunch of books. No, no, they're real. Oh, they're okay. pages and everything. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so we, we actually can't move from the county in which we currently live. Um, and there isn't a university magically on our doorstop that teaches the seriology. Um, so this is a way that we can keep pursuing our passion and keep researching. Um, and, and keep it real. And keeping it real. Um, but share our knowledge and, and the education we've been very fortunate to receive um, with other people without um, having to like, actually have jobs. <laughs> Or at least academic and, jobs. And now, um, the one question that's that's burning inside of me right now is, why are you not dancing with Josh in his rap video? Um, I'm remarkably self conscious. Um, <laughs> yes, she, see, I have no this. There's this thing called shame. I have none of it <laughs> apparently. You don't so. have that, okay? Well, and Megan, John, I can I, I can commiserate. Here, John, real quick. Oh, sure, sure, yes. This is, this is something that I've seen in digital Hammurabi stuff, and it's something. This is a little more serious that I deeply share, which is when you learn history or anything else, you answer the question, "How do we know that? Why should I believe that?" Not just, "Hey, I saw something on TV. Hey, uh, this guy at a bar told me that Julius Caesar only had one testicle." <laughs> But really, I think we're all into this issue of explore how we know that and what we don't know, what we don't agree on. Exactly. Well, and I and I know who got that extra testicle. I'm looking at you, Dr. Josh. Um, and so, look, uh, I wanted to say to Megan, I definitely uh, commiserate with you on the self consciousness. I'm the I'm the one person here who's not on camera tonight. So, go well, I I won't uh, even dance in a an empty house with the windows closed and the curtains drawn. <laughs> Uh, so, I mean, I do, I do weird mum dancing with, with my kids, but that's about as far as it goes. It's pretty hot though. It's really not. <laughs> my, so, my students complain to the Dean when I start dancing. <laughs> so basically what you're saying, They'll Megan. Sing, but dancing, no. Basically what you're saying, Megan, is that, that, that Josh is, Josh is a, a, a jackass enough for the two of you. <laughs> I'd yeah, say he's okay. talented enough for the two. Yeah, of us. No, I know. Yes, he is. I, I'm, I'm, I, that when he played the the Gilgamesh rap, that was probably I would say the eleventh or twelfth time that I. <laughs> um, so uh, back to the Griffiths here. Now, if um, you kind of touched on this uh, when 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 we started, but is there you know for lack of a better term, like is there like a mission statement in what you're putting out or like a best describe like what your goal is in putting this content out please watch us <laughs> okay I, I like that i like that that's that's oh, okay. tweetable. that's tweetable no no i mean oh. i think i kind of covered it before we're trying to say one we're trying to be entertaining which is not easy um but two we're trying to say you know it's not settled we don't know yeah Look at the look at the controversies. Look at the different sources. It's really a show on historiography, but, uh, which is what it usually mm -hmm. turns into. This source says this, but we try not to do it as dryly as as I was taught historiography. Uh, we also in try grad to focus school. on specific events rather than right. saying, you know, um, are left-handed people smarter than right-handed people? Something right. like that broad. But we also fill up time on the channel. Uh, we just came back from the vacation, and so you know. We stuck up, stuck up, stuck up, stuck up, stuck up, stuck up little clips from there. And we visited a. Uh, As a matter of fact, yes, Jerry, what was, I watched one with you where you were doing a stand up outside in front of a statue of a gentleman and his name escapes me. And you were talking about how this, this person was like a benefactor to, uh, you know, children. Robert that were, Owen, that's in Manchester, yeah. England. Robert Owen was a factory owner and we're going to do a show on this coming yeah. up. Um, we're doing some deep research, but Robert Owen was a factory owner who tried to be progressive and tried to create this ideal community. And, and that's enough for now. He, he yeah. did little things like saying, hey, maybe we should not have children working in factories until they're 10 years old. Yes. And that was considered yes. progressive. Ten year, you, you can't work in the factory until you're 10 years old and, and giving them free education. Uh, and 
was a very he was a very experimental sort of individual but he was what we could probably call a proto socialist he called himself a socialist yeah that he that that there was a socialist movement before Karl Marx came uh, and messed it all anyway, up that's uh, so yeah that, that's, yeah let's yeah we'll save that for we don't want to give too much away from your right. from the video you're going to do and going back to to uh and i, I wish it, it's the bowens right bowen Oh, and Lewis. Yeah, okay. Yeah. She doesn't um, like me enough to take my last name. Oh, wait, that's right. I'm sorry, Megan. I, <laughs> oh, I please don't worry. Yeah. Uh, so, well, matter of fact, I'm going to call you the Lewises from now on. Uh, <laughs> so you I'm you down. basically already touched on that question I gave to Griffiths. You know, you were talking about how it allows you to, you know, continue on with your academic oh, pursuits, you know, as far as like the, the kind of videos you do and everything. But why don't you follow Dr. Misha's uh, example there? And if you just had to give like a short quip that best describes your content, what would you come up with? What you say? If you think it's simple. You probably don't understand it. <laughs> all right, all right, I like that. We're going to be tweeting both of those things out. Now, uh, we'll start with we'll, we'll start with you. And the next question is, and I don't know what made me think of this, but uh, I just want to know is starting with with uh, with Josh and Megan is working together, you know, on these projects on YouTube is does that does that seem to strengthen your relationship? Yeah. Definitely. Oh, no question. Um, it's like yeah, a, yeah. I mean, this is how we met. So we met in grad school, um, but it's, it's an, what? <laughs> no, just picturing <laughs> my, trying to flirt with her early on in the library. <laughs> hey, um, you're, you're new to, to the school. Um, and this, this is, is, a library. is, this is a library. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you have those in England. <laughs> Do you need help? Me, do you want me to like show you how? Like, so, okay, so here are the books. Um, I can like show Dr. you. Dr. Josh, did you have a mullet? Uh, no. 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 Okay. No. Um, Doctor Doctor Misha and Jerry, uh, I, I think I already know the answer to this because I just I'm, I'm just tickled pink whenever I watch the two of you doing a video. But could you could you? say real quick you know how how is working together on these projects how does that strengthen your relationship i mean does it go ahead i'll get corrected if i say anything anyway i, <laughs> I okay it's it's a subtle game we play where i suggest something and then i don't talk about it anymore and then about three weeks later he inevitably says you know i have this idea well, I tell you, I, I I thought that was really precious the way you use use the word suggest, just in deference to Jerry. I... <laughs> we we have a little understanding, which is that she's probably right, but it takes me a while to realize that, and that's yeah. he'll that catch up for quite a while. Yeah, yeah. Now um, let's let's we'll we'll start wrapping this up because we got a really interesting discussion to get to. Um, uh, uh, next question I want to ask you. Actually, this will be the closing question, and we'll we'll uh, reiterate what the channel names are, what have you. Um, if you, we'll start with the Griffiths. Um, if you had to point to one, you know, project or video on your channel, or maybe a video series that you're most proud of that you've produced, w which one would that be, and why? Hmm. For us on our channel the one we're most proud of which one robin hood was pretty good robin Hood was good the japanese internment was good yeah um and, and, okay. what was the last one let we me did? ask you oh, john oh, 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 john do you have children? the last one we did which one is your favorite yeah i uh i have no children that i know of okay. oh okay <laughs> well okay, <laughs> you know but it is that question it's, it's, right. which one is your favorite it's, it's, yeah okay no I that's, that's... we've done things that didn't always click but um honestly we did a two-parter on tammany hall we started talking and we just there was so much more to talk about that we just had to continue with the next week just, yeah just and I, and I think what gives jerry the most joy is to do the promos and nobody watches them <laughs> and and they are nifty little nuggets of jerry's humor that that comes out we just enjoy oh, doing the globe them. down I, yeah i took the globe down um, well, we, we, we redecorate every show. Uh, 
so those are fun too but you know as far as digging deep in the research jerry does a great job and uh you know i'm along to for the ride well and you know i've uh uh interacted with jerry a few times in hangouts and and, and and what have you but when i caught that video the other day when he was talking about and again I'm, i lost the name already robert owen. robert owen and i it was almost like another side of Jerry because he was doing a stand up, you know, doing, doing this, you know, video about this gentleman instead of being in just like an open conversation and a hangout. And I, I gotta tell you, I mean, I, I was kind of disappointed that it was such a short video. I wanted to hear him go on a little more about that. And I look forward to the longer video you say you're going to hey, do. John, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out, which is might be boring for the rest of the audience, but when you get done watching us, go ahead and type in, useless history i've got like seven videos that i did that are long form there and they were a great deal of fun but they were just so much work <laughs> right right Huge well we're gonna we're gonna put a link to that in uh in the pin comment after this uh, post is a video for sure useless history that'll be easy to remember um and then the same question to uh uh josh and megan if there was one video or video series that you've done for youtube uh, which one would you say you're most proud of and why? I think the Sumerian grammar videos, hmm. which are Josh's amazing um, language course. Um, and for those who have never tried it, Sumerian is remarkably difficult to learn. Uh, there's not an awful lot in the way of introductory material that doesn't require a degree in linguistics to understand. Um, and I think he's done an excellent job of going through the, the introductory stuff um, clearly and concisely, um, and they've been they've been pretty popular. Yeah, like by far, yeah, the like most popular his, videos his, on our channel. The first video in that series is yeah. the most watched video in our entire channel, which is surreal to me, but really cool. All right. Um, so again, uh, it's Josh and Megan of Digital Hammurabi. We'll get the link down there in the comment section after after this posts a video. And uh, Jerry and Dr. Misha hit there. They go. They're they're sharing it right now. History, Working ourselves hard. <laughs> yeah, history unsettled. And uh, I got to tell you, it, you okay. got to go over there and check out their content. Uh, both uh, Digital Hammurabi and History Unsettled. And something that Nick Suter ha has told me in more than one hangout, and he suggested when he was there, all you people that are listening now, you're all multitaskers. Ta taskers. So so don't wait. Head right over there now and sub to their channels, and then you can go back when this is over and look at their content. Because if you wait, you're going to forget. So go over there now and subscribe to Digital Hammurabi and History Unsettled. And we're not going to say anything interesting tonight anyway, so it's okay. Uh, okay. All right. Well, that, that's, I hope you're wrong. Um, look, uh, so tonight's discussion, uh, which uh, was uh, Dr. Misha came up with, Monster Mythos. I, I, I came up with a title after she said this is the discussion, and uh, then I got their approval, and it's Monster Mythos. The uh, history of legendary creatures. Uh, Dr. Misha shared a outline, so we're going to get going here, and I'm just going to let them take it away. The, the two couples here, and maybe I might, I might just be a fanboy for the rest of the night, uh, but I might interject with a question here and there. But before we start, I want to do ask, what made you, Dr. Misha? Why did you come up with this topic? Um, because Jerry suggested it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And what? And what? And, and, this and, was <laughs> honestly, we've been wanting to do something with DigiHam for some time, and it yes. was something that we kind of felt like this was something that they have an expertise on that's going to really be different, but still work together with the stuff that we right. talk about. Much of my knowledge is Middle Ages, and much of Western civilization has roots in the Middle East. I don't know if if, if you guys yeah. are aware so, of that. Uh, <laughs> so so. Digital Hammer Rabbi has a, a huge set of information that we can play with. I've got the Greeks and Romans down. Jerry's got the Middle Ages, and we can move forward from there. So, so, so when you, uh, Doc, Josh and Megan, so when you heard this topic, you were just like, I'm all in, like, as soon as you heard it then, huh? Pretty much. Yeah, like 20 minutes ago, I was all in, oh, okay. and I heard it. Um, 
20 minutes ago. You were what are we doing okay. tonight? Oh, yeah. He's exaggerating. I told him <laughs> no, about it I, yesterday. I almost forgot to mention when I mentioned your channels, too. If you want more of Dr. Josh's raps, you can download him on iTunes. Um, that's, 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 that's yeah, that's if you totally type in fun. Eminem, you'll find it. It's, it's yeah. they're very they're roughly the same. <laughs> All right. Well, look, let's let's get right into it. I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Misha because she, as I said, has uh, has an outline for this. And I'm just going to let you four uh, go at it. You seem to get along fine. I don't think I have to moderate you much. And I just want to listen to what have you what you what you have to say. And when I come up uh, with questions uh, where you need to educate me further, I will interject and ask. OK, well. What we really wanted to talk about was mythical creatures, if only because they seem to spread throughout, throughout time. It seems to be something that humans like to talk about, monsters. Uh, and we're going to look at the harmful mythical creatures from different uh, cultures, not just the, you know, the happy, fun unicorns, etc. Because all throughout human history, we keep running into monsters. They're they're rarely the same, but, but they have a lot of commonalities. They have we've commonalities. Got basically, yeah. different types. We've got serpents. We've got hybrids, which are you know again chimeras and the, the teeth of a unicorn, right, the right. nose of an ostrich, the, the tongue of a diplodocus, whatever. Yeah. Um, we've got and we've, then you've got the humanoids. Humanoids, and we've got the general things that are normal every day, but are like distorted in some way, really big, or there's a whole bunch of them that shouldn't be there or whatever. So um, there's been a lot of different work thinking about, well, why do we have, why do we all have these creatures? Why is there these monsters? So that's kind of what we wanted to get into, why they're here and why we like them so much. Because we don't want them to eat this stuff. Let me, if I may, Go into my little sure. spiel? Yeah, go into your little spiel. OK, I'm going to propose something which, based on my research, I don't think we should overlook. It's a radical idea. It's a scary idea. It's a different idea. Right. That's what we're here for. And this idea is that dragons are real. I'm not talking about just big crocodiles or lizards with funny teeth. Dragons are, or at the very least, were real. OK? Just think about it, keep an open mind, have a different perspective, you know. If people are gonna believe that the earth is flat, you can at least consider the possibility that there's dragons out there. So let's talk about some arguments for this. Number one is biblical. According to the Pew Research Center, 27% of Americans believe that the Bible is the inspired literal word of God and everything in it is literally true. 27%, that's 90 million people. So all of you, if you didn't know this, Dragons are in the Bible, we're done, okay? You're already on board, dragons are real, I don't have to argue with you, <laughs> okay? The other 72%, we've got some talking to do. But I'm gonna go over this just a little bit because it make it clear. In the King James Version of the Bible, dragons are mentioned 34 times in 20 separate passages, okay? There are a little bit more in the Catholic and the uh, Greek Orthodox versions of the Bible, we'll cover that later because that's kind of an interesting story, okay? Um, now, there's another five references if you count the Leviathan. The Leviathan is a very interesting subset of this story, but what that means is a different story. Dr. Josh can give us some insight on that. You know about the Leviathan, Josh? You up on him a little bit? As much as one can be, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> the biblical passages are fairly cryptic, but let's just, okay. So some of the references to, the, to dragons in the Bible are probably symbolic. And if you don't believe that the Lamb of God has wool, then you can probably say that the dragon of the book of Revelation isn't necessarily a dragon. But there are a number of others that are not that much that case. I'm going to give you just a few examples here. Jeremiah 51, 37. And Babylon shall become heaps, a dwelling place for dragons, an astonishment and a hissing without an inhabitant. Okay. Um, Isaiah 13, 22. Isaiah is really graphic sometimes. And the wild beasts of islands shall cry in their desolate houses and dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come and her days shall not be prolonged. Now that does not sound terribly symbolic to me. It sounds like somebody is saying these things are real. Would you do me a favor? 
Sure. Here's a Bible. I'm going to get to something. Would you look up the uh, 14th chapter of Daniel? I'm going to make a reference. This is already done. And you should find it fairly soon. Um, here's a section on the Leviathan, which is uh, from the book of Job, chapter 41. Canst thou draw out the Leviathan with a hook, his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Okay, continuing, chapter, verse 14. Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible round about. His scales are his pride, shoved together as with a closed seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together. By his sneezing doth the light shine, shine, and his eyes are as the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps. Here we go. And sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils goeth smoke, and out of a seat as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindles coals, and his flame goes out of his mouth. Okay, that's a description of the Leviathan. That sounds a lot like the dragon. Now, the Leviathan is possibly a sea creature in other references. But, okay, have you got the 14th chapter of Daniel for me? Mm-hmm. You do? Yeah, I don't. You don't? Nope. Why can't you find the 14th chapter of Daniel? It should be right after the 13th chapter of Daniel. Where's there the 13th there is no 13th chapter of Daniel. There's it, no 13th chapter of Daniel. It There's ends no on the 12th. 14th chapter of Daniel in the Protestant Bible. Now, yep. that's kind of bizarre, okay? Because if you look up in the Douay Reims Catholic Bible or in the Greek Orthodox Bible, there's mm -hmm. a 13th and a 14th chapter of the right. book of Daniel. Okay, what's going on, folks? Somebody trying to hide something from us? Okay, from the Douay Reims Bible, here is 22nd through 27th verse of the chapter 14 of the book of Daniel. And there was a great dragon in that place, and the Babylonians worshipped him. And the king said to Daniel, Behold, thou canst not say now that this is not a living God. Adore him, therefore. And Daniel said, I adore the Lord my God, for he is the living God. But there is no that is no living God. But give me leave, O king, and I will kill the dragon without sword or club. And the king said, I give thee leave. Then Daniel took pitch and fat and hair and boiled them together. And he made lumps and put them into the dragon's mouth. It doesn't say why a dragon was willing to hold still. You mind if I shove this stuff down your mouth? Okay. But anyway, and he put them into the dragon's mouth, and the dragon burst asunder. Ooh, I love that. And he said, Behold him who you worshipped. And when the Babylonians heard this, they took great indignation. Okay. Good stuff. Not in the Protestant Bible. Okay. There are a couple theories about why it's not in the Protestant Bible, but one of them could easily be that there's something they don't want to talk about. Like maybe they don't like the idea of dragons. That's a literal description of a dragon. It's in the Bible, okay? That's argument number one. Argument number two, culture, okay? We talked about this briefly before. This is a big planet. Dragons in some form or other exist in almost every culture. Chinese, India, Europeans, Babylonians definitely had, I'm gonna say this name so you don't have to, Mushkushu, is that right? Close enough. <laughs> Mushkushu. I like Mushkushu pork, but that's a different story. Okay. Um, so every culture has stories about dragons. Is this coincidence? What are you doing? You're telling me to speed it up? Yep. Okay. Well, I've got more stuff to go here, and then, then you can attack. Okay. We talk for 20 minutes and you're back. Okay. Is this coincidence? Now, Carl Jung, the, philo the uh, psychologist, said, no, it's race memory. You remember things your ancestors saw, and you're, millions of years ago, they saw dinosaurs. Okay. You want me to believe that? Wait, 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 wait. saw dinosaurs. Sorry, what's that? No, I, I'm kind of mumbling to myself. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. Okay. Uh, I, uh, but I, so basically, what you're what you're saying here, Jerry, is the Game of Thrones is historically accurate. Not necessarily. <laughs> um, I don't personally think that that's real blonde hair on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a dye job. <laughs> I think you're right on that. All right. So there's the maybe it's dinosaur bones, people say, but Scandinavia has a lot of le legends about dragons, and there's almost no fossils there. Okay, main Western traditions of dragons that we know come from the tales of Beowulf and St. George. We might get to those later. Okay, so there's the question of what we mean by a dragon. Uh, some dragons are bigger than others, some are smaller. Um, a couple of pictures here just to waste your time. This is a medieval drawing of a dragon. Okay, that's nice. Um, and I'm gonna, uh, it takes too long to find stuff. I gotta keep talking. All right, 
Okay. Well, I mean, just something I want to interject real quick. Something I find most fascinating that you mentioned, Jerry, is that you you don't just find it in certain parts of the world. You're saying in, in the histories of all cultures, back in their history, there's legends of dragons or dragon-like creatures. Yeah, in just in just almost every culture, there are some that I don't know enough about to say. So I can't tell you what's in every culture. Um, yeah, there's a there's a reference in the Chronicles of Novgorod, uh, in the 13th, early 13th century, uh, the monks of Novgorod, which is a ah, city in- That's in my spiel. Is that in your spiel? Okay, yeah, never mind. There. Okay, you do it. Right. Well, um, and- I was and trying to find it, but I continue, can't. Before you continue on with your spiel there, let me ask the, the uh, um, I keep wanting to call you the Bowens. The Lewises. The Lewises, that's right. I'm gonna ask the Lewises. Is there anything that, that Jerry has brought up thus far that you'd like to weigh in on, uh, you know, from your side of the table, you know, of your vast knowledge of, you know, you dragon hunters that you are? Nope. <laughs> if I thought Jerry was genuinely serious, then he and I would have some words, but I, I'm intrigued to see where this is going. All right. No, I, 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 no, he has almost got me fully there. I'm, I'm halfway to believing in dragons. So I want to I see if he can finish the job. Go ahead, Jerry. All right. So let, let's, the next argument is, of course, biological. Could such a creature exist? Okay. Fire breathing, there's certainly no known fire breathing creatures on the world today. No. There are some really weird creatures in the world. You never met my ex wife. They, they can, <laughs> they can, they can okay. spit poison. A second ago, I was trying to show you a picture of St. George and the Dragon. Now, St. George was a real character, uh, lived in the third century. He was a Roman soldier. The tale of St. George is a classic tale. He's traveling down the road. He sees a young woman tied to a tree. Uh, he says, what are you doing here? I will rescue you. And she says, no, I'm going to be fed to a dragon. And they get into this discussion, and the dragon comes up and attacks her. And he hits the dragon in the head, does not harm it, does not kill it, takes part of the woman's clothing, is where the story gets a little racy, uh, <laughs> ties up the dragon, leads it back into town, and says, you know, you guys should all be Christians. They said, no, this is wrong. <laughs> he says, I'm going to loose this dragon on you. They said, we're Christians. <laughs> and then he hacks the dragon to pieces because that's what Christians do. <laughs> but the dragon in this story does not breathe fire. He spews poison. Now, this gets back into my biological point. There's something called a spitting cobra. It spits poison up to about six and a half feet. Mm -hmm. So spitting poison for a dragon or a snake creature? I think that's not inconceivable. There are also electric eels and electric rays. Uh, Romans knew about electric rays. They used them for medicinal purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, ray as in you know, the, the, the fish. The fish, not the, not, fish. Not the, the big event. flappy okay. fish. Iguanas have been di determined to have three eyes, which is amazing. Now, what I'm saying is nature gets weird. They have three eyes. They have a third in the back of their head, which they can't focus or see, but they can tell light from dark with it. This is real. This is an amazing thing about iguanas. All my point here is animals can be weird. Okay. Okay. Now, while no animal can shoot flames, there's a, certainly a circus trick called fire breathing. The record mm -hmm. is 26 feet, and I've actually seen people do this. They pour a liquid in their mouth. They find some way to spark it. It shoots out. It's really great drama. Well, I, actually, I knew a circus performer that did it, uh -huh. and it, and and they use a mixture of water and lighter fluid, and they shoot it out from between their teeth. And if you've got a gap between your front teeth, like like me, you you can you can be very adept at, <laughs> at doing this trick. Okay, but this is a matter of could a creature naturally produce alcohol and be able to spew it out of its mouth? Before you say no, think about how many weird creatures there are. Okay. And or how alcohol is produced. How alcohol is produced. And we haven't gotten into the everybody's favorite, the bombardier beetle. Right. The bombardier right. beetle mixes two chemicals in its abdomen, and I know that all of the Christian apologists have focused on this, shoots it out at about 200 degrees Fahrenheit, which right. is significantly higher than the flash point for alcohol. So if a creature nationally produced alcohol, yeah, it is. I looked it up. Okay. Uh, all right. <laughs> okay. I'll, I'll um, you. Oh, there's more. Animals can produce, as a byproduct, methane. You probably know this. Uh, mm -hmm. Global warming talks about cows producing methane. But cows release methane from both ends. Right. About a third of humans actually can release methane in their belches. 
Right. So is it conceivable, not that it happened, but is it conceivable that an animal released methane has some method of sparking? Or for mm -hmm. that matter, somebody coming along, an animal in a cave, and there's the spark, something happens, there's a torch down there, the thing burps, no. there's fire coming out. Okay, that is at least conceivable. Okay? Here's a real one, and this is wild, and if you don't know this, it is uh, quite shocking. Let's see if I got my picture of him here. And real quick, I just want to interject. I know that uh, human beings can even have a, a condition whereby their body produces alcohol. And, yes. you know, there's people that have gotten into trouble because, say, they were in trouble with the law and they weren't supposed to be consuming alcohol. And here their body was producing it and they're getting all these results from testing that they should be getting. But so you're, you're, you've almost got me there, Jerry. I'm all sure. right. Don't don't be so close minded. I cannot find my picture. I'm not going to take time on it. Okay. Uh, there is a creature in Southeast Asia. They're relatively common called the flying snake. Now, but, if you don't know this, when you get done, look up on YouTube, type in flying snake. They are amazing. The range of a flying snake, the longest documented flight. I'm going to find this. Thing. Um, longest documented flight by a flying snake is 300 feet. The length of a football field. That's pretty good. It's pretty amazing. There are there. There he is. There he is. This is. Um, yep, come on, picture. Picture, come up. Okay. We, we see it. Cryospidia, the flying snake. Um, now, they flatten their body. They do some weird stuff. And again, it is a glide, but they can glide farther than a flying squirrel. So if there's a flying snake, could there be a flying lizard? You know? Just whatever. Largest true lizard that ever existed was the Megalonia, which is a species of monitor. It was found in Australia. And this is not a dinosaur. This should not be confused with the dinosaur. Have I got him here? Yes, there he is. This is a picture of the skeleton. 27 feet long. OK? It is believed that these things did Ouch. exist at the same time as human beings. They went extinct about 40,000 years ago. There were humans alive at that time. You know, they didn't have cable TV. They were a lot less sophisticated than us. Um, but it did exist, OK? So and they quite possibly had venom because many monitor lizards today. So how many species go extinct over time? The last recorded sighting of a dragon that we have is in 1217. I'm going to get right. to that in just a second. OK. but. One estimate said 500 large species and maybe 10,000 smaller species go extinct every century. So for there to be weird creatures that existed in recorded history and for them to be extinct now, it's certainly not inconceivable. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, to, to talk to you, I believe that isn't the figure that's out there that like 99.5% of all species that ever existed are extinct now? I mean... Isn't it something yeah, like that? Yeah, but that's over 600 million years. So, yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> and and I mean, what existed 100 million years ago is a different story. Okay. Yeah. And you say and you say strange creatures existed. Didn't bugs used to exist that were like the size of dogs and, and things yes. like that? Yeah. So there was a, a, a dragonfly that had a three foot wingspan, but curiously, those could not exist today. And this is off topic, but fascinating because they the lived chemical. in a time when there was more oxygen yeah. in the atmosphere, and they could not survive today. But yeah, this is all fake news, though. We know the Earth's only 6,000 years old. Okay. <laughs> all right. The other thing that we've got, my other argument, my final argument for the fact that dragons should be considered seriously is eyewitness accounts. Okay? Now, people talk about a lot of things that they don't have eyewitness accounts for. Again, flat earthers are out there. Nobody has ever seen a flat earth. But first, we're going to start with Aristotle. And in section, he says, the dragon... When it eats fruits, and this is from his book, The Story of Animalia, book six, the dragon, when it eats fruits, swallows endive juice. It has been seen in the act. Okay? Now, endive juice sounds weird to begin with. Yeah. But the dragon, when it eats fruits, has been seen in the act. And he wasn't talking about crocodiles because he talks about crocodiles in the next sentence. He talks about how right. clovers will pick teeth out of their, pick food out of the crocodile's uh, teeth. Right. Which is also true. It's amazing. So this is a, list of his amazing things. That is an indirect account. That's somebody seems to have told Same him he says yeah. it. Here are two absolute eyewitness accounts. 
The first is from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. This is a ninth century book. It's available at the British Library. You can even read it online. And describing the year 793. In this year, fierce foreboding omens came over the land of the Northumbrians, and the wretched people shook. There were excessive whirlwinds, lightning, and fiery dragons were seen flying in the sky. These were followed by great famine, and after those the same year, on the 6th of the eyes of January, the ravaging, wretched, heathen men destroyed God's church at Landisfarne. Landisfarne is a real place. It has a wrecked church there. Okay? So we know part of this is definitely true. But guys describing dragons. Other one I have is from the first chronicle of Novgorod. The, this is dated to around 1270, but it's described in the year 1214. And this is the reference you were looking right. for. And it's a little bit hard to pronounce some of these Russian I, or I, old Slavonic yeah. names. Yeah. You want to read it? Go ahead. Okay. Where is it? All right. Okay. 1214. On February 1st, on Quinquagesima <laughs> Sunday, there was thunder after morning service and all heard it. And then at the same time, they saw a flying snake or dragon. On the same day, Niaz Mstislav marched with the men of Novgorod against the Hood people at Erevya uh, through the land of the Hood people towards the sea. He ruined their villages and captured their forest fortresses. Okay, so that is an eyewitness account of a dragon. And as he right. says, every, that's, that's mine. Oh, okay. <laughs> it says, many people saw it. So we're going to have to say there's only three possibilities. Right. The Chronicle is lying. Right. Everybody had a mass hallucination. Or, or there was a dragon. Or there was those, a dragon. One of those three things is true. Okay. So those are my arguments for why we should reconsider dragons. But to conclude this, I can't prove dragons are real. Nobody's going to prove a dragon's real until one walks in, sits down at the bar next to you and orders a beer. Right. Um, which might be good when they're finally hot. Okay. We don't even agree on the definition of a dragon. Were they scaly things? Were they huge? Were they 30 feet long? Mm -hmm. Were they just this little thing like Komodo dragon? Okay. But we have multiple sources of information, evidence that creatures at least as weird as dragons did, and in some cases do exist. There are consistent descriptions from cultures that had little or no contact with one another, and we have multiple eyewitness accounts from people who had no reason to lie. So I can't say for certain the dragons as we perceive them were real, but you can't say for certain that they weren't. Words. Yeah. That there is a there is certain evidence. That's my dragon talk. That's your dragon talk. Can I start my own YouTube channel? Dragons are real? What do you think? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got you got me thinking, Jerry. You got me okay. thinking. Uh, everything I've said is true, but I've left out certain key factors in the midst of that, just because you tell the truth, you don't always tell the whole truth. Right. For example, animals that produce methane naturally are all herbivores. Right. <laughs> but the point is monsters, um, dragons in particular, part of our culture, um, people believe they were real. They use them as examples in many stories. And, you know, it yeah. wasn't that hard to put yourself in the place. But just... Just in case anybody's wondering, there are no dragons, really. Trust me on this. I don't know. I think I see the, uh, Dr. Josh's wheels turning. In his next rap video, there's going to be dragons in it. I'll bet you anything. So, Dr. So, Josh and Megan, what about what? Uh, what about the Bab your your gang, the Mesopotamians? What do they say about about their uh, critters? What kind of what kind of things do they have? So um, there are similar categories to the ones you named earlier. There are um, like humanoid uh, monsters. There are um, uh, Mishvazen, the um, chimera types that are a combination of various different animals. Um, some of the gods, I think, have quite monstrous tendencies and personalities, even though they're not monsters as we may truly understand them to be. Um, and, and a lot of the times they are um, forces for good, actually, which mm. is, is interesting because when we say monster, generally speaking, you have this really negative connotation. You've got monsters uh, eating virgins and um, 
uh, uh, giants destroying things and, and that kind of thing. Um, but in Mesopotamia, quite often, um, the monsters are called upon uh, in a protective capacity. They're used in... Um, in rituals, they're invoked in rituals to protect people against illness, against evil spirits, um, against misfortune. Um, their uh, little figurines of them are buried underneath um, structures to keep houses and to keep buildings safe. Um, Sometimes they work in like power factories, <laughs> powered by fear. Not, not, so, not so much that one. The water in the tanks would have dried yeah. steep herba? Yeah. Well, but I mean, Hambaba. Of, of the Gilgamesh epic, he he was guarding a forest. Exactly, and he he was um, he was put there by the gods. And actually, this is a, a recurring theme. A lot of well, all of the monsters that you see are, um, with a couple of exceptions, are carrying out the will of the gods. So even if they are acting in a destructive capacity, um, so the Bull of Heaven, I think, would cla would be classified as a monster in the Gilgamesh epic. Um, it's set loose on the city of Uruk by the goddess Ishtar, and it's incredibly destructive, but it is carrying out a divine will. Um, it's not just rampaging senselessly. And I think that's maybe something else that we should... <clears throat> keep in mind through a discussion like this um, we tend to when we when we categorize things we tend to want to put them in in a discrete units and say all right this this creature acts this way and this creature you know does these sorts of things uh, particularly talking about something like Mesopotamia you're talking about you know 3,000 years of of, of history uh, with and a massive geographical expanse. It's yeah. not. It's not as though it's um, one. Um, uh, what's I mean, the word? One single culture. It's not it's, homogenous. It's a bunch, yeah. No, it's not homogenous. It's a bunch of different things. So, so when you talk like Oppenheim in his book, his popular level book um, on Mesopotamia, he he has a chapter. It's a little extreme, but it's called "Why a Mesopotamian Religion Can't Be Written," and. It, while again, I don't think everybody agreed with him on that in detail. Um, there, there's some truth to that. So when you think about a monster like Anzu, let's say, who is a giant bird with um, often the head of a lion, and it's kind of associated with with lightning and destructive weather powers. Early on in the third millennium, um, you know, he's he's associated a lot with the city of Lagash, uh, and. He's a he's a good character, right? He fights on the side of of the gods. But as as time goes by and Lagash sort of falls out of out of prominence, um, you see Anzu developing some bad characteristics uh, in the mythology, and so he becomes, you know, the the creature that steals the tablet of destinies from the god Enlil and has to be defeated by Ninorta and Girsu. Um, and then that trope kind of gets carried down. Uh, that's the one that, that kind of gets carried down. So there's not this um, homogenous, you know, looking at looking at someone like um, Anzu, you can see there's a development in the in the monster itself. So the way they appear, the way they're used in the mythology and the literature, um, it can change. You want to be sensitive to that that sort of thing. What about Moshkushu? The dragons, um, so they're not they're not terribly prominent. Um, they turn up in the Enuma Elish, the creation myth, as one of the seven monsters that Tiamat, seven, one of the eleven monsters that Tiamat creates um, to fight against the gods, um, and then obviously it, it's it's defeated by Marduk very um, easily, very easily, um, and it in later periods becomes is it like adopted as the um like the heraldic beast of of marduk of the city of babylon and then when um babylon is is taken over by the the neo-assyrian empire um they kind of migrate the mushushu up north to become the like the, the um the beast associated with the god ashur um so it, again it's a similar progression to to what you see with the anzu bird um when uh, the political um, fortunes of a city fell, quite often their gods either were demoted um, or were just replaced or moved to um, a more pro politically prominent city. Actually, it's interesting you mentioned the uh, Marduk 
uh, defeated this. Tiamat. I can't remember all these names. They, they go by too fast. Very easily. And I'm, I'm just intrigued with this aspect. And it's just mm -hmm. um, in the tale of Perseus and uh, Andromeda. Andromeda, which is very similar to the tale of St. George and the Dragon. Um, right. Basically, Andromeda is tied up to a rock and is about to be eaten by a sea, sea monster. monster. Yeah. Perseus yeah. shows up, pulls out Medusa's head. Sea monster died. The end. It's like, where's the... I want, I want action. I want, you know... Yeah. I want I the Hulk to battle him out, and I want what scenes, but it's like, and I, have you found this in other mythos too? So, oh, so one of the one of the interesting things about the Enuma Elish, and we have a shorter video on this, an earlier video actually on our channel, um, is that you know everybody knows. About, I was getting ready to say everybody knows about the Enuma Elish. <laughs> Obviously, everybody knows about the Enuma Elish. <laughs> Uh, you know the the story of Marduk, uh, you know, getting getting the kingship uh, and conquering Tiamat and saving the other gods. Um, you know that story is uh, like a, a reworking of the of an earlier story from the second millennium uh, called uh, the Anzu myth. And the Anzu myth is I was sort of referring to it before. You know, Anzu is the antagonist, and he steals this really powerful thing called the Tablet of Destinies, and he flies off into the mountains with it. And the god Ninorta, Ningirsu, he has to really go through a lot. There's a lot of fighting. And he's like, he has to be persuaded to do this, because yeah. none of the other gods are going to go and commit to this battle, because they know that they can't defeat the Anzu bird. Um, and Ninorta has to be really talked into going forth and, and doing battle and he he fails the first time yeah he goes out and he has a, a mace that you know he goes with him and, and it's a talking mace it's a lot of fun and uh <laughs> i feel like we could do a whole other stream on talking weaponry yeah we really could but this is like a good D, &D game there's action as it yeah. up. here look at this head yeah. you're dead <laughs> But you know, he goes out the first time, and there's a there's a big fight, and you know, all of everything's shaking and thunder and you know whatever, and he shoots arrows at him, and because the the Anzu bird has the tablet of destinies, which in short allows you to control nature, um, control the known world, Anzu says, you know, arrows turn back, go back to your thicket whence you came, and so they they you, turn and go back. What did you say they were? The what tablets of what? Tablet of destinies. Sounds an awful lot like so, sounds an awful lot like Infinity Stones. To yes, me. there's this Very glove. Similar. <laughs> um, so in the in the end, just spoiler alert, I guess for those of you that are maybe not going to read the Acadian version tonight, um, save it for tomorrow. You need a, you need a fresh brain to get your head yeah. around that one. Uh, the way that he wins is not by his might; um, it's by Enki, the god of wisdom. Uh, or Aya, you know, in the Akkadian story, um, teaching him a trick. And uh, when he when he's getting ready to shoot his arrows, he says, cut off some of the feathers on Anzu's wings. And when the feathers are falling down, Anzu will say, feathers return to me. And when he says that, shoot an arrow, and the fletchings oh, will bring the arrow to him and kill him. So nice. it's, it's, it's not might, it's not, you know, this power, it's trickery that wins trickery. but that's a better story than just mixing up hair and fat and saying here eat this yeah <laughs> when you come into the 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 enuma alish though the, you know the more the more popular story um the the god ningirsu the that role is taken over by the god marduk and the because marduk was more politically important his city had, had like come to the fore so that's right. he just gets replaced and Marduk, uh, he doesn't need to be convinced uh, to go. Um, he, he volunteers, right? And, and when he goes, uh, these the, 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 there's a, the Tablet of Destinies is involved. There's a, a god, like a sidekick of the god, goddess Tiamat that has the Tablet of Destinies. He's defeated while Marduk is arriving. Like, he's, Marduk is so powerful. That... And, and sorry, that's where the dragon comes in. This is why he was, the dragon that's was right. defeated so easily, because it's like a precursor to the main battle. That's right. It's like these 11 monsters that were terrifying all the other gods. Marduk's presence 
defeats them. And so it's, you know, it's, the reason that that happens is because the story is trying to show... My God's better than your God. Just so right. much better and so much more powerful. Um, so... Is that the moral I, lesson? Oh, go ahead, John. Sorry. No, I just was going to say, I mean, I I can't uh, I can't even believe that I'm here with the four of you uh, because uh, you I'm could be doing other things with your evening. Is that what you're saying? John? <laughs> right. Well, well, right. I mean, I could I could be reading comic books or, you know, whatever. <laughs> I mean, uh, but, you know, you know, you're talking about Marduk and, and all that I can think in my head is this comic strip I used to read as a kid called Marmaduke. I, I know you're not talking about, <laughs> They're similar. Not talking about that. So. DuckTales actually made a character called Murdo. It's spelled the same way as the guy. So. Whatever. They, they probably thought they were pulling a fast one. Um, well, were the, were the monsters always a foil for heroes? This is actually something we were debating earlier, is that the monsters... Okay, heroes in Greek mythos often die stupidly, but monsters usually get defeated. I think it's right. hard to think of any exceptions. Is that what you find, Jim? I mean, how, so it, in I was going to say, go ahead, but it depends on how we define. Uh, so, I, uh, in the mythologies, generally speaking, yes, but monsters show up in a lot of other places, and a lot of monsters that don't show up in the literature, like the literary text, come mm-hmm. through in ritual texts, in incantations. Um, so, you have um, the the demon Pazuzu is um is it like a dog-headed demon of um like yeah. evil. Pazuzu is the name of the demon in the exorcist it is yeah oh, okay. okay all right I, I just interject real quick is uh, now what i thought i heard you guys saying a little bit ago and i jokingly alluded to infinity stones when you were talking about the tablets of destiny but it seems to me that in some traditions the monsters were their superheroes yes and and, and you you do you kind of see this in um uh, like Humbaba is is a really really powerful um, monster who's a, supposed to be a force for good is unfortunately killed by Gilgamesh anyway. But then some of the um, and not by might. That's the other yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, it's another trickery. Thing. This yeah, is one okay. of the. This is one. Of, sorry, no, but Humbaba is now. He was a monster. Was he a grotesque or what was he like? Yeah, exactly. we were talking earlier about how up until much later, most of the ugly creatures were ugly all the way through. Was was Mbaba? Yes. Okay. Well, mm. like only a mother could love that sort of thing. <laughs> so that we have some oh, yes. some. Rebel's um, mother loved him too, but that's yes. a different story. <laughs> <laughs> we have some terracotta plaques, and and Humbaba shows up in some cylinder seals. Um, he has this. His face kind of looks like intestines, um, which is why he shows up because he's sometimes used um, for divination, um, and in in um, extispacy, if, if like if. If oh, there we go. Just, oh, oh yeah, sweet. nice. So if if like um, a fetus yeah. is born and looks like Humbaba, then the city will fall. Well, not the city, the whole Doc, state Doc, will collapse. Doctor Josh, thanks a lot for doxing me. <laughs> what? He said you just doxed him. Showed a picture of John. Oh, I was like, oh my god, was there something up on my phone that? Had... <laughs> Now I but yeah, yes, so Humbab is is ugly. Even though he's a force for good, he's horrifically ugly. Um, but he, the the plaques of him seem to have been put on walls, possibly as some kind of amulet to protect. We don't know what to protect against, but to protect against something. Ooh, yeah. I'm gonna get the amulet. Oh yeah, sure. Is it out here? Um, I think it's in the st- in our bedroom on the desk. Okay. Sorry, we have a prop that we forgot we had. Um, uh, but also the um, like the goddess Tiamat, who's the main antagonist in the Enuma Elish, she's kind of she she blurs the line between goddess and monster, because she starts out she's one of the primeval uh, the primordial pairs who creates the main pantheon of gods, um, but in the end she she tries to kill everyone so she has to be defeated herself. Uh, I always felt quite bad for her. <laughs> I didn't hear what you said, but I felt bad for her too. Tiamat. Oh. Is this still mm. something? Uh, so, uh, talking about how um, Humbaba was used as a. Um, an amulet. Like an aperture break mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, there's a god named Era, E R R A, and he's a very destructive. Um, 
I don't know, bloodthirsty sort of, at least the, in the story. The literary text we have that refers to him, it has him complaining that he hasn't killed anyone recently. Yeah. <laughs> and in that, in that, in that myth, um, you know, he, he, Marduk has gotten old. It's an older story. I mean, a, a younger story. It's a first millennium text. And uh, Marduk's gotten a little old and a little off his game. And uh, anyway, Era's very, very destructive. And so you would think if you were reading through that text, Era's kind of the bad guy in the sense that he's killing people in the city, which he wasn't supposed to be doing. However, we have this, which... Second. Is that focusing, you think? It, it's, it hasn't focused yet. Um, gotta... Looks like hieroglyphics. Sorry, Megan's yeah. better at this. Yeah. It's oh, there we go. There you yeah. go. All right. Oh, oh, oh. but it's. Did you see that part? <laughs> <laughs> see, Jerry, it's an interesting text, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but this is a, a replica that we have. It's um, actually two size, uh, and this is an amulet with a, an and extract was, of that particular myth on it. And it was made by Jeremiah Peterson, and he has an Etsy store that he sells these. And so. Uh, Ancient he, text, modern scribe. He's awesome. Go and look at it. He really is awesome. If you can oh, see. Oh, your class. Yeah. There's a there's a hole that's drilled in the yep. side, right? And you, it was hung ostensibly around someone's neck, but it has a portion of that text on it. And so Era, even though he's a monstrous sort of bloodthirsty guy, deity, yeah. the power that that deity had, this portion of the text was supposed to imbue the amulet, and then of course the individual, at least to, to some degree that protective power, that power to protect the individual that was wearing it. So even though a, a, a god or a, a monster might be considered bad by our, our sense, that didn't stop them from utilizing the power of that monster in a protective sense. It's, uh, it's interesting. So I, I have to ask is, yeah. um, you two, in the, the Middle Ages and, and Greece and Rome, is there anything... Like, similar, do you have monsters being used for beneficial purposes or for, um, like, amulets or protection or something like that? I have a little bit I'm going to talk about on that in a few minutes. Sure. But you go to the Greeks first, because in the yeah. Middle Ages, indirectly. Yeah, but, but definitely in the Greeks, of course, you had the, the, all the squabbling gods, and they're, and they're getting into um, all sorts of mess with the, messes with humans. It's, it's like there was a meme I saw today. It says... Greek mythology and it's this book about this thick and it says Greek mythology without Zeus's sex life and it's just like a little <laughs> thing. Um, but uh, most most humans wanted to stay away from the gods just like the uh, in the Sumerians uh, but there were a handful of gods that were that were positive they weren't actually weren't even gods they were the Titans uh, Prometheus was was a titan a giant uh and i believe the titans predated the gods or at least the pantheon that we're familiar with zeus and hera uh and of course um uh doo -doo 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 -doo. i forgot his name i just said his name prometheus prometheus thank you brought fire to man um he f felt sorry for man because we were all shivering in the cold and so he brought fire and that was oh, the that one was thing where the Eagle developed a taste for certain. Yeah, of course, yeah. There must be fifty the, ways to love your liver. Ooh. Oh. Anyway, um, so the the rest of the gods did not want humans to to have fire because they feared humans becoming as powerful as the gods. So they punished um, um, Prometheus. Thank you, Prometheus, <laughs> as um, chained him to a rock and had an eagle eat his liver out every day. Uh, and of course, when Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, the subtitle of the book is the modern Prometheus. So, so she's picking up, yeah, she's picking up that's... about that story as well. So it's a story of, of both promise and yet, and yet, uh, uh so much. horrible, yeah. horrible, um, uh, ending up. Consequences. Consequences, okay. thank well, you. Well, yeah, it's certainly a story about hubris and downfall. Right. But by knowledge in Greek mythos, the gods were pretty much humanoid, and the, the mon titans were different, and the monsters tended to be like supporting characters 
who are usually now, now help me out here. Well, OK, there, yeah, a lot of the a lot of the um, of the monsters were both bad and good. The centaurs, the half man, half horses uh, in certain stories uh, like Jason and the Argonauts, uh, Chiron, the centaur taught uh, Castor and Pollux taught uh, Jason and taught Heracles. Um, and and the rest of the Argonauts raised them up. He was a he was a wise old centaur, but there's also a, a another description from Ovid's Metamorphosis where uh, a group of centaurs break into a wedding and carry off the bride and rape all the women at the wedding and kill all the men, and they're just horrible creatures. So you've got the same type of creature that does both good and bad, depending on the creature. Um, in the Middle Ages, we get into the, the creation of bestiaries. Now, this is an image from, oh, be up. is it up? Sorry. This, no, it didn't go. There it is. All right, my, my system's a little slow. This is an image from the Physiologus. This is a 19th, 9th century copy of a 2nd century book which listed animals, all animals, but they were uh, they included mythical animals. This is a classic one. And again, this is a much later drawing, also from the Physiologus. We don't actually know who the author of the Physiologus was, but this is a pelican. And a pelican, according, doesn't look like a pelican, but that's what they said it is. Yeah. According to the belief at the time, a pelican would, uh, the mother would pick open her own breast to feed her young on, right. on her blood. Yeah. And so the bestiary was a list of creatures like this, and it included both real creatures and mm -hmm. dragons and monsters and centaurs. And each one of them was accompanied by a moral lesson. Moral lesson. Mm -hmm. The physiologus is, to my knowledge, the first reference to unicorns could only be captured by virgins. Right. So the idea is if you want a horse, don't get laid. I don't know. <laughs> but so this was a way that they were used and these books were continued. And as I, I showed that picture, um, this last picture, this is from probably 16th century. I'm not exactly sure. Um, this is uh, the Aberdeen bestiary. This is 12th century. So they would list all of these animals and then they would describe, basically there was a moral lesson to them um, oh, here's a unicorn. Um, uh, this is actually from Cosmos Indicop I can never say the name. Indicoplastes, a uh, Greek monk. But, oh, that's a different story. Um. <laughs> but but when, you get, when you get natural philosophers, even going back to Aristotle, collecting stories of these animals, and Herodotus, uh, who predated predated Aristotle, uh, collected all sorts of stories from people who had traveled everywhere. Herodotus is, is pretty honest about saying, I don't know whether these things are true or false. This is just what people told me. Aristotle, uh, being an empiricist, is trying to collect all of these animals and put them together and, and describe each and every one of them. And his idea of monsters, although he doesn't use the word monster, it's a, it's a much later word, he sees them as errors of nature. Uh, and you have the, the error comes about when the offspring does not look like the father. Because to Aristotle, it was the father's seed that was implanted in the mother. Um, everything had to do with the father. The, the mother was only this receptacle a passive receptacle. Um, so he was, Aristotle was kind of uh, convinced that anything that didn't look exactly like the father was was monstrous. This included women. <laughs> um, <laughs> he was he was not one to, 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 you know, kind of say, yeah, women are a little weird. They're missing parts. It's a little bit funky. Maybe they are monsters. Uh, but right, Aristotle. That's Aristotle. Who was still progressive in his It was issue. still pretty Women progressive, yeah. Other issues. Uh, his daughter, he trained as a scientist. Yes, but it's not until Cicero and the Romans that the ideas of, um, of terror and pending danger come in with the description of monsters. Before Aristotle was just pretty 
empirical in his in his description but cicero is saying monsters show up uh when something horrible is going to happen the romans were very big into signs and and revelation from animal guts and so when they saw someone claim to see a monster it was a sure sign that something horrible was going to happen um can we talk about pliny what pliny pliny who's postdates Cicero, uh, wrote a huge number 37 of seven volumes, 37 Historia volumes of, of nature. He's trying to record everything he can about nature. And he was convinced there were monsters, uh, but they were just kind of wonders of nature. He didn't, he didn't put a moral lesson to all of these things. This but, is a ski yeah. is, now The drawing is from 1493, but this is based on a description within the Historia Naturalis. This is a guy who's got one big foot. Yes, this is this is a creature that that Pliny uh, describes. He had one big foot, and the whole um, population just hopped around on, it on like their Gulliver's single foot. It sounds like foot. they're just being silly and yeah. like, you know. And I mean, Gulliver's Travels, of course. Now, but Pliny's writing real real right. science. His book is full of things that really exist and things he's trying to describe. Yeah. Whereas Gulliver. Jonathan Swift was clearly trying to tell stories. To tell stories and lessons. have allegory and, and allegories. Um, but they, uh, Pliny was convinced that yes, there were monsters, but they were always somewhere far away. So you couldn't really hold him to, you know, where is this thing? It's it's way over there. And, and it, uh, uh, if I can, yeah. one of the things that we mentioned on our show on the, uh, the history of the belief in the flat earth was right. the people in Roman times, and mm -hmm. even much later, believed that south of the equator was an uninhabitable. They, right. they believed the Earth was spherical, right. but the temperatures kept getting warmer and that it would be too hot, and so all sorts of strange things were pictured down there. Right. Um, the here be dragons on a map did not occur until 1507, right. which is a different story. Different uh, story. When we finally get into the, to the Christian era with St. Augustine, St. Augustine didn't believe in monsters. Um, he basically said they cannot, if they are not human or described in the Bible, then they don't exist. What about dragons? Well, he would have said maybe somewhere, but anything that wasn't quite uh, either described in the Bible or wasn't born of Adam, that was another thing that he insisted so, uh, sorry, had to happen. Um, in, in Mesopotamia, something we see is... Um, monsters inhabit this this realm outside of civilization outside of of like the normal world and it's kind of semi mythological you can kind of go there but it's it's really 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 difficult do you have the same kind of thing um in in the greek and roman record oh yeah oh yeah uh the, well they're never living in the community you know? yeah they're yeah the monsters <laughs> everyone has to go somewhere there's always the epic travel going somewhere to find the monsters but when you're talking about borders um modern people who study monsters there is a monster studies program monstrology uh, no monster studies um it's really 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 new and one of the guys who basically started it uh was named jeffrey cohen and he wrote a book in uh 1996 called the monster thesis and um he talks about seven ideas about monsters and what makes a monster and one of the most important aspects of the monster is that it dwells at the gates of difference that it's not only not with us but different from us and that it is basically borders on the possible um, that we can, it's not something that's so totally beyond our ken that we can't grasp at least parts of it. But, but modern monster studies, basically it's people who are studying psychology. Oops, we got feedback. Basically, basically, um, it's literature. It's it's mainly for a literary audience that's interested in deconstructing monsters, finding out what they're made of, etc. 
I have to adjust something. Okay. <laughs> All of a sudden, we started getting the YouTube okay. video plans. Um, what's next? We've got a lot of questions out there, and um, I'm going to live. talk for a second about sea monsters because they are slightly different. Yeah. Um, is that is that is that where we are in the outline? We're we're up to the sea creatures portion. Oops, I've lost. Can they not hear us? I oh, know we can. No, we can hear you. Can you not hear us? We can hear you. She's not, and she can hear you, but I can't hear her. Okay. Talk for a second. I'm gonna. <laughs> yeah, beatbox okay. for us. Me. I was just going to say that we don't have a lot in we the way. We were wondering of if there was if there was a um, if there were water creatures in See, Mesopotamia. You have um, it was because it was a desert. You, so you, you do you have some. You've got uh, like the um, the Alkalu, the fish men, um, who are depicted as as often men wearing a whole fish over their body, um, and they're like a a sage kind of thing. They're not. They're not monsters, they're um, wise beings who come in and give information to, to mankind and, and kind of are very beneficial. Um, and, and the goddess monster Tiamat, I mentioned earlier, she's, um, she's conceived of as basically being the sea. Uh, and her, her spouse, Apsu, is, is the fresh water. So they kind of, uh, they, it's described as they mingle their waters together and create um, the world as, as it was known. But That's there's awesome. nothing... They mingle their waters together. <laughs> um, and you have a lot of, a lot of mythology takes place around water. Um, there's a, a, a myth that happens in, in a place called Dilmun, um, and it, it describes the marshland and, and and that kind of thing, but there's no um, there's nothing. Well, no, actually, I'm I was going to say there are no n nothing like like mermaids, but we, there are exactly there are mermaids and, and mermen that are depicted in some um, in some reliefs. Um, they don't seem to figure largely in the mythology, so I can't tell you an awful lot about them. I think one of the things that's important to recognize, and this kind of goes back to your to your opening, Jerry. Um, we think about the biblical texts because we haven't talked a lot about them, and that's that's absolutely fine. Um, sorry, that sounded bad. Um, but, um, you know, I think a lot of people read through the Psalms. They read through Job. Um, you know, they read through these texts that talk about things like Leviathan and Rahav and, you know, these these creatures. And you'll hear people try to narrow down what they are right okay here's leviathan you know in modern hebrew uh leviathan is like a whale uh if i'm remembering that correctly and so you know it's what what, what is it you know what is behemoth what's what's behemoth you know is it a, a hippo or i mean and I, I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that if you think back to the text in genesis 1 you're you're talking about a motif of a watery, primordial creation, you know, pre-creation world. And you see this in the Enuma Elish, as Megan just said, you know, Tiamat and Apsu kind of mingle the fresh water and the seawater together. And of course, that's not the only place that sort of thing happens. But so you have this sort of primordial watery mass um, and this is sort of where these creatures uh, figure in. So Genesis 1 doesn't really describe that battle. Um, it, I think the, the going theory at this point is that there were different traditions in Israelite history, uh, or in Israelite tradition, oral tradition probably, uh, where you had um, this more cosmic battle that involved these creatures, um, something again akin to something like the Enuma Elish. You see this in Canaanite mythology with Baal and Yom. Uh, but, but so I think when we think about the sea and we think about these creatures, these monsters, they're intimately connected. Um, and so I, on the one hand, I think we, we all want to be careful, not obviously us here, but just for those listening that, um, you know, are wrestling with what, you know, what could these things be and uh, what creatures should we assign these to? For those like young earth creationists that are trying to identify 
what type of early creature this is that God created, it's probably good to disavow ourselves of these ideas that we should try to pin down what kind of creature this was walking around. That's probably not what's going on. Uh, these are monstrous sort of um, you know, cosmic battle sort of uh, um, creatures that are that are involved here um, and, and involved in that sea and that primordial watery creation era that uh, or um, motif that is touched on or is talked about without its cosmic battle um, aspect in, in Genesis 1 in the creation story. That was probably really long-winded, and I apologize profusely. No, that's yeah, okay. No, it, well, it's, 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 well, it's, it's a very long way of saying I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and of course... It's what I'm best at. In, in China, they had they had dragons that were associated with elements, the the classic elements, and they had dragons that could only live in the water, and they had uh, dragons that could only live in the ground. They couldn't go through water or air, which is like, that's really bizarre. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, that's hard to wrap your, your mind and around. Again, they're still coming back to, is this done to illustrate a certain story? You know, right. How these, these mythos are written. By the way, Megan, you mentioned something about mermaids a while ago. Yeah. Uh, so there are a couple of depictions of, of mermaids and, and mermen. Um, that is literally all I know. Unfortunately, it's um, the wrong time period for my particular specialization. I but also mention that, um, uh, okay. There was a, oh, she's got to take care of something. Um, here's a quote that I ran across today, and I, you, this is fairly well known, but it's still interesting. The Admiral relates that on his visit to the Rio del Oro yesterday, he saw three mermaids standing high out of the water. They had faces something similar to those of human beings, but were not so handsome as it was customary to represent them. He adds that he has formerly seen them in Guinea and on the Pepper Coast. Now, the Admiral in this case is, of course, Christopher Columbus. This is from... Uh, the journal of his first voyage. Um, but it's, it's just a fun thing to throw out there. A lot of people think that he was seeing manatees, um, which I guess if a guy's been at sea long enough. <laughs> <laughs> which is where Barbara manatee comes from. So I don't, I don't oh, understand. Okay. It's Veggie Tales. Oh, it's, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Larry the Cucumber. I apologize veggie, to everyone. Strike tales. that. Let's move on. Um, and just let me uh, let, let you folks know, uh, it's about 10.05 now. We can go for another, like, like around 50 minutes. Uh, there is something else coming up at 11 o'clock uh, that I don't want to in interfere with uh, that I'll mention at the end of the program. I am going to have to bail before too long, too, although we have, I wanted to address a few of the comments, at least in passing, and there's somebody, has, I've gotten an objection around here that I want to get to in a minute, so we'll <laughs> got a few more things we can chat on or we could just chat all night you know this is fun yeah yeah um and so when you say comments to address you mean like from the live chat yeah uh, oh okay okay I'm, I'm glad that somebody's watching it and i would i would say just before we do like i mean i feel like this is this has been good uh and i feel like people probably enjoyed it uh, it'd be a good thing to have a part two I would say. Yeah, we, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I mean, and, and as far as like the outline that, that Misha sent, there's still, you know, plenty that you could talk about. Now, I said, I said we could go another fifth, five, zero minutes, not 50. I will minutes, fall asleep. Maybe, yeah, I mean, we happens. could, yeah. like theoretically, yeah. John, that's yeah, possible. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, oh, oh, well, but no, if you're, if you're saying that we should start winding it down, that's, that's absolutely. Uh, cool well, I too. think. I would like to, and I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I would like to look at, okay, one, we've had several people, and maybe it's one guy who's really passionate in the live chat talking about Norse mythos, and um, I could talk about that for maybe 35 seconds before you realized I was making up stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my knowledge of Thor and Loki comes from... The Avengers movie. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it would be a good topic, John, for you to possibly explore in a future show. Um, something that involves the Norse mythos and how it fits into the whole picture. Oh, I mean, it, really, from this whole the whole outline that, that uh, Dr. Misha sent me, I mean, there's so many points on there that, I mean, they could almost all be their own show. I mean, Yeah, it is uh, a, it's an awfully big topic, you know. As, as we said when we started, we're going to spend an hour and we're going to explain all monsters <laughs> and all the monsters. Well, uh, how about this? Uh, I did post in chat 
uh, a little bit ago that towards when we got towards the end that I would put a call out to the chat for questions and to go ahead and tag me. Uh, and I, I, I said I'd w wait towards the end so that I can make sure I'm watching chat, catch okay. those. John, any, question, any questions that you noticed yourself, Jerry, that you already know yeah, about? First off, yeah. um, I've got somebody, I, I've got, there's this complaint that has come in. And um, I, I think really think we need to address this issue. This is coming from um, Rex. Um, Rex, what, 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 what is it, Rex? <laughs> You don't like the way we're depicting monsters. But you're monsters. Well, why do you like to eat people? Because we taste like chicken. Oh, Look, you as a monster represent something to our entire species. You represent our fears, our anxieties. How you represented it in different times, in different ways is somewhat irrelevant. The point is, we're not worried about your feelings. You're here to make us come to grips with our own. Michel Foucault. <laughs> Deconstruction. What do you know about deconstruction other than stepping on Tokyo? <laughs> you like that? <laughs> you monster! <laughs> anyway, I don't know if there were oh. any out there or not. Oh, man. Oh, oh, hey, uh, from from the live chat, a uh, uh, gentleman named Frustrated Atheist says, uh, John, um, on the next monster show, I could come on and talk about, and I'm going to murder these names, but you guys probably know them, Jormunder, Fenrir, the dwarves and giants, and yes, some of the gods idea. within North... I do know a little bit about Fenrir and, and the whole mythos and the creation of uh, Valhalla was done with gold that had a magic cursing effect that turned dwarves into dragons. And uh, I mean, it's, it's good Tolkien-esque stuff and it, it's, it's great. But I am still also interested in this theme that, that uh, Rex was bringing up about what monsters represent to all of us and how they represent, you know, incarnations of our fears, the things we're afraid of, our, our evils in our society, and, and how we come to deal with it. And I just want to put the call out uh, to the live chat. I am uh, not much of a multitasker, but I am right now watching the chat. If you have any questions, tag me with them. John Peterson, and it is uh, S-E-N at the end of Peterson, not S-O-N. Uh, Puff Lovegas asks, uh, where would one look to find the Griffin's uh, documentaries? I think he's referring to, of course, their, their channel is History Unsettled, uh, but I think maybe he's referring to like some of your work that you did when you when you worked with PBS. Um, you can find some of that stuff on Amazon. Um, it's out there. Um, oh, Misha, you missed it. Oh, what did I miss? Oh, we had a special guest come Aww, in. Oh, yeah, I it was, um but I mean, is there anything they would look up specifically on Amazon to find some of your earlier work when you were with PBS? Um, you could probably type it in. Most of it's under my name. Yeah, uh, under Jerry some of this was done uh, through, uh, we dealt with a lot of religious themes and some people might not find that entirely comfortable, but um, it, it, was, it was part of what we did. And so we did a whole film on the King James Bible which was, was very detailed. And we had stuff on uh, medieval barbarians and, and uh, people burned at the stake for fun, you know, things like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I can give you a list of titles. Uh, Without Due Process, it might not be out there. That was done literally 30 years ago. It, it is, there is a copy available at, of all places, West Point. The West Point Library uh, had a digital copy made 
Okay, um, one of the things I'm a little bit embarrassed so about some of this stuff just because it is old and technology has yeah. changed so much. Um, Blind Courage, the unique genius of Jan Zizka was the story of a medieval knight who fought in the 1430s and, and conquered various things and never lost a single battle, which was pretty impressive because he was blind. Uh, <laughs> so uh, from the live chat, uh, Iron Charioteer asks uh, for all on the panel, uh, what do you know about the half man, half fish god Dagon and its relationship to the Pope? Um, it's incorrect. Dagon, uh, it was Dagon, not Dagon, um, was not a half man, half fish. He was an agricultural deity. Um, and as far as I'm aware, there's absolutely zero evidence that he's related to the Pope's hat. Um, okay. As so a, have I have I have I just been punked with that question, or was that a real question? No, no, I, that was a real question. Oh, okay, Pe people okay. do make this <laughs> argument that, that there was a, a half fish god who, um, and that the Pope's hat is somehow the like the fish, like either the I can't remember if it's the head or the tail. I think it's the fish head, um, but it Dagan wasn't a, a fish god, so that doesn't that doesn't work. Uh, hey, uh, Jerry, uh, of love, I guess. Uh, clarifies his question from earlier he says he specifically was interested in a video that was blocked from premiere in california he thinks okay that's again this is a detailed story it's, it's way off topic we had a film okay. that they, the government tried to suppress for purely political reasons it wasn't really that much about the content uh and that was without due process you're welcome to search it's hard to find but it was made 30 years ago with limited technology and you know it's it's low resolution it's not it's not something i'm really proud of okay it, i mean except for the fact that we got interviews with people who have now passed away who were really pivotal a lot of people do yeah eventually <laughs> a lot a lot of people pass away eventually yes I yeah. guess. So, there's actually um, a track record yeah. to that I think um, Josh had something to add to the Dagan. Yes, yes. yes. I mean, so, <clears throat> so dog in Hebrew means fish. Uh, when you put own on the end of it, uh, I mean, I haven't looked at this in a long time, but dagon is like a diminutive. Uh, little fish. Yeah, like a little. Fishy. So um, you, dagon is the you know the name of the deity. So calling him dagon was like a. a, a I have to go back and look at, it, but I think it was a slight. Um, but it's just to throw that out there, how the, the connection. Okay, so I, I don't know really anything about the post hat because they sound similar. Basically, a, a yeah, that's phone. right. Mm -hmm. Dagon, Dagon. Um, yeah, particularly because in Canaanite, well, never mind. <laughs> I was getting ready to do a little linguistic thing there, and it's probably not a good idea here. Not a little impress people. Yeah, because I'm, I'm I'm an idiot, so don't don't confuse me too much. Um, so uh, I'm not seeing any more questions in the live chat. And uh, a couple of you did mention that if we go too much longer, you may pass out on camera. Uh, I would like to mention something here because we're not going to get to it. And I don't know where this is going to go. And just talk for just a few minutes about modern monster mythos. And yes, please do. Please do. Some of this involves, of course, today monster mythos are really created in Hollywood. And you know, they are still fulfilling some of that issues, the fears, the movies, the creatures, the battles. Um, and by the way, while we don't defeat dragons anymore by shoving cotton and hair and fat in their mouth, that is also the first recorded case of a closed door mystery. Um, oh, okay. It just is a novel. But much of this, I think, does start with Mary Shelley. Um, Absolutely. And of course, uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. And the modern reinterpretation of the monster as representing society out of control. Right. So it was yes. a different set of fears. Instead of being afraid of natural forces, it's you're afraid of society and all of the repercussions right. of that. Right. Because they, because it, in Mary Shelley, the, the natural forces have been somewhat tamed. Um, and the creation of, of Frank, Frankenstein's creation. Frankenstein is not the monster. Frankenstein is the man who builds the monster. I and read the yet, book. Yeah. Dr. Frankenstein is a monster. Yeah, Dr. Frankenstein is the monster, but it, but it has these wonderful themes of, of what, is, what 
what makes life important? You know, what makes a thing alive? And is if it's just breathing and the heart beating, is that truly alive? Or is there something more? Of course, Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley was, was a romantic. So she's going to say, of course, there's more than just the physiological happening. But you've also got this, this, it is the start of the Romantic era, right. but you've got this fear of society out of control. Right. And so that's clearly part of what he's representing is this technology that you can't control that is killing people and right. taking over. And you've created this, you have to live with this, this tremendous sense of guilt and angst, which to me doesn't exist in the older monster mythos. I think, and, and right. we might be wrong. I'd love to hear Josh and Megan on this. I think that we reinterpret the monster because it suits different needs to us today. Before they comment, just let me say thank you, Dr. Misha, for sharing your prom picture. <laughs> Ooh, snap. <laughs> um, but the uh, but modern monsters stopped being quite so much other creatures and just being humans that were a little off. When um, when Columbus brings back knowledge of the new world, the assumption becomes that they're all cannibals because they couldn't possibly be the humans we've read about in the Bible. They're monstrous. They have to be a different. So there's a whole set of Caribbean um, monsters that are just a little bit off what we think of as human zombies. Uh, which was an African influence in the Caribbean and, you know, very much along the lines of this is a creature who had been taken out of their normal world and killed and turned into a slave. Um, I didn't see this discussion going yeah, here. <laughs> but, but there's... And I'm not prepared. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. But, there's a, but, but the, the more modern monster are things that, that are just slightly off. I would love to hear from Megan and Josh about how they see, if they see any themes from Canaanite and Mesopotamian culture resurfacing or reinterpreted. I know some of the names are borrowed from movies like Pazuzu, but. I think you see a need to control and a need to uh, understand and that the unknown is always scary and difficult to comprehend. Um, so rather than having um, monsters living way out um, in in the wilderness that's kind of semi-mythological, you have um, humans who behave in a way that we don't understand, like especially with things like psychological th thrillers. They're not they're not monstrous in appearance necessarily, but the way they behave is is different and confusing, and because it's different, it's scary. Um, and and it, it seems like a lot of the um, a, a lot of the fear is rooted in the the lack of understanding and and the lack of of the ability to control what's happening. I'm a little lost, <laughs> <laughs> to be is honest. There, is it is it like half past coffee o'clock for you, Josh? It's entirely possible that I was working on the production side with OBS, trying to prep for the end, and missed part of the conversation. That's possible. Okay, all right. And we can accept that. Um, I know you're easily distracted. Yes, I am. Thank so, you. Uh, and not terribly uh, bright. That's the other part. So. <laughs> but you are, one yeah, hell right. of a, you are one hell of a rapper, though, man. So you got that <laughs> to fall back on, brother. And I... Get, I, I, I I want you to, in your next, I, I asked for Megan to dance in one of your rap videos, but now I want to see Rex in your next rap video. <laughs> I think that's a great I, idea. Uh, uh, um, so I think, I think we can uh, wrap things up here. Uh, nice wordplay. You know, yeah, good. there's a, there's enough on that outline left that, that we could, uh, you know, do a second show on this. And uh, I'd like to sometime in the near future get you all together again, even if it's on a different topic, mm -hmm. so that we can have Jim participate. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that would be lovely. I, I, I'm get, 
yeah, and I'm guessing what happened is because he said they were doing some work on the lines around his house. And he's having trouble with his internet. I think that maybe uh, just whatever means he has to communicate, the internet, even his phone and everything, must have like you know crapped out because yeah. they're doing some kind of work in this area. Or maybe and, a monster got him. <laughs> well, that could be given the given the topic tonight. Uh, I hope that's not the case, however. Uh, and uh, as I stated earlier, uh, we're going to uh, get all of their information in the uh, uh, pinned comment uh, below the video once it posts. And just to recap here, and Jerry, I already forgot you mentioned another channel that had you said seven or eight videos on it from a while back that you did. It was what history? Uh, useless. Useless history. Okay. Um, so as far as the Griffiths are concerned, they have History Unsettled, Useless History, and Misha Griffith. Those are their three channels on YouTube. Any other platforms you guys have uh, content on that, that people need to know about? Um, yeah, there's pictures of us hanging up at the post office. You can stop. Yeah, don't, don't pay any attention to those. OK, OK. I think uh, I don't know if yeah, I, no, I, I don't Is there, I mean, how much money are they offering? <laughs> uh, but no, um, so and then uh digital hammurabi josh and megan um are there uh, that's the name of their channel digital hammurabi are there any other platforms people should know about that you have content on um yeah we have a twitter that i will um semi-often post uh longish threads about various different things it's uh digi underscore hammurabi um, we will be starting within the next year um, an animated kids channel called Animesopotamia. Oh, wow. snap. <laughs> cool. We've made the account, so if you find it, subscribe. That would be great. There's nothing on there yet. I'm very sorry. Um, I want to get several um, videos ready. Sorry? I'm curious about this. I was, so we, um, we learned... Our daughter just finished sixth grade and, and we learned that they actually teach Mesopotamian history in middle school, um, which is really, really cool. Yeah. Um, and we've spoken to a few middle school history teachers who are, well, social studies teachers who have said that there's not an awful lot in the way of um, um, up to date, kid friendly information. So, uh, yeah, we they were, were really excited that. They when when Megan went in for like the meet the teacher day, meet, meet the teacher that, when she found out that uh, you know Megan does a serial, she said, "We gotta have you come in. We gotta have you come in." So, <laughs> so how are you doing the animation? Are you? Uh, um, so it's it's. We are highly skilled, <laughs> trained professionals. <laughs> so I did actually spend a few years in art school. Um, you want to show so them, it's uh, yeah. So uh, it won't be. Um, I've got a big, big box of crayons. I could send you. I'm not using them. So it won't be terribly sophisticated. Um, I'll animation. tell you what, I have got somebody for you, and I think that Dr. Oh, Josh knows Yeah, there's several programs that do that, so yeah. I, cool. I, I, I think there's Dr. Josh might know who I'm about to mention that is one heck of an artist, and she might be able to help you guys with that. We, I, I, I have even, spoken. Do I even need to say her name, Dr. Josh? <laughs> I don't even know who her. Cheshire Vic is. Oh, so. okay. All right. Well, I won't say Cheshire Vic then. Cheshire Vic. Uh, and boy, I wish I could off the top of my head remember her art uh, domain. She posted. Well, she's she just, posted. She, they're getting ready to start that Slippery Slope Slip, channel. The Slippery Slope show, yeah. yeah. But she has tweeted out. Uh, she has a website. Yeah. Like, uh, I'm, I'll I'll, uh, I'll remember at some point here and mention. Okay, so there's uh, there's again, one more. Oh, John, go sorry, Megan's gonna do one more just because it'd be kind of interesting. She's getting ready to start a Twitch channel, like in the next week probably. Um, so Twitch for anybody that doesn't know, Twitch is a gaming platform. It's a gaming platform. So oh, cool. She's gonna be playing um, something. What is it? She's tending to Oliver. Heaven's Vault. Heaven's Vault. Oh, okay. I've heard. I've that. told you more than I know. Crusades. Heaven's Vault. Oh, Crusades. I believe. Well, I don't like okay. Crusaders. That's what they were nasty people. I don't like, sorry. <laughs> but yeah, she'll be streaming that out, so that'll be uh, fun. Yeah, lots of fun. How fun! Very cool. All sorry. right. So I think I need to get to bed. Yep. Me too. Yep. 
Scott. And it's been a pleasure. Right. It's really been has. wonderful. I'm so glad we could do this. I, I am too. I hope we can do it some more. Mm. And I hope that, that we got our technical... <laughs> If we ever do it again on an 8 o'clock show, we can be on the air before 8.30. 30, yeah. to... <laughs> <laughs> All right, well... Uh, oh, can I, I also wanted... thank our very patient people who sat through some of this? Yes. Oh, hey, the public. I'll tell you what, and, and I promise you, I know for a fact that there's going to be more patient people watching this in the future. Uh, we didn't have a real big audience here live, but I guarantee you this is going to get a ton of views uh, as a video, for sure. Uh, hope so you know and um so look i want to thank uh jim majors for bringing me on here of course uh, this channel disciple of kairos uh, if you're not uh, sub please sub to it uh please share this video um i want to thank uh, josh and megan of uh, digital Hammurabi for joining us tonight and i want to thank jerry and misha of history unsettled and uh useless history and Misha Griffith has uh, a channel up on YouTube. We will get not all the information. like it. No, they're not. Uh. <laughs> We're going to get all that information up uh, in, in the uh, comment section of, of this when it posts as a video. Uh, we will have these folks on again sometime in the near future. Uh, I had a blast. Um, and it was a special treat for those who have seen me do streams because I was so interested in listening. You didn't have to hear me at all much of that um i always try and end all my streams with a quote and jerry inspired me to look up uh, this quote and we'll end the stream uh after i say this quote uh i beheld the wretch the miserable monster whom i had created mary shelley